the conversations have been developed in a time of pandemic to deepen the artists' uh, engagement with each other, the community and the public. But we think we'll carry on doing this beyond the pandemic. It's a new form for us to explore. At the end of the conversation, there'll be at least 10 minutes of question and answers. So if you put your, your questions on chat, uh, we'll try and get through as many of them as possible before the end of the evening. So just write down anything you want to ask as you think it, and we'll go through it later. Um, huge, huge welcome. And I'm leaving it now to the artists, Richard Peacock and Sandra von Hasselberg. Cool, thank you very much, Jana, for the uh, introduction. Oh, am I, I'm not muted, good. Um, and hi, Sandra, it's nice to see you again. Yeah. Nice to see you. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I, I visited you at your studio the other day in preparation for this, which was um, quite an eye-opening experience in a way for me because, um, you know, I, I, I don't have a studio as such. My studio is my computer and my desk. And so it was very refreshing to come and, you know, to see you in action and, um, and also help you a little bit, which was a nice, nice touch. <laughs> I didn't do much, but I did help you a little bit. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, it was also what I, what I thought was immediately striking is because I'd looked, on, looked at your work, um, obviously on your website and I'd seen it obviously in the past, but I, because time has passed so quickly since the last time, you know, since the last show, or whatever we've um, had together, um, I, um, I'd forgotten the scale of your pieces and so I'd looked at things on, you know, on my screen and um, kind of seen them, you know, very, in, in a way, some, in, in some way the way I look at my own work, it's quite sort of two-dimensional because it's on a screen, but then looking at the physical pieces, they were really quite large and quite so, so, so tangible and it was just a really, just a really lovely thing and also to see the process of the lengthiness of the process of, you know, getting to where you want to be. And, um, you know, one piece that I don't think I, did, I saw it live in your studio was um, multi-purpose number six. And um, I really like that piece and would love to, yes, to um, just talk a little bit about that and, and kind of ask you, you know, how you, yeah, how you came to make these decisions because it's for me it's a piece I look at it and it looks very sort of at first glance it's really you know um, it's really happy and it's very light and it looks very random you know and of course having seen you at work um, I know how controlled this randomness is in a way because of the planning you have to go through all the steps you have to go through and how 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 much um uh you know just how much time and effort goes into every single stage um which is so in contrast to the way to what i'm doing and um which is and and yet you've achieved this amazing lightness which i think is great um you know just the way things are overlapping and the, the way you've used the space the uh, the, the way you've bring, brought that one shape that you're using to life, you know, by the way you've rep repeated it in different positions and with the opening, mm. and so it's just, you know, the negative space is as, as important as the positive, as, a, as the actual shape itself. So um, it'd be good to hear how you, you know, how you made some of those decisions um, considering every step, every, every time you, decide to, to place a shape where you place it, you know, means a massive step in your, you know, in your process. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, let me tell you a bit more about it then. So, so uh, first of all, just so everyone knows, it, it's a screen print. So each of those shapes is a separately printed piece of work. So that's been on the press a lot of time to get that number, many of the uh, shapes on there. And it's called multi-purpose because that little shape is actually a piece of packaging from a roll of multi-purpose masking tape. So I quite often use uh, little bits of packaging as the stencils for my printing. 
Um, mm. So that's where the title comes from. And it's number six because I made a series of these prints. And initially they were quite rigid in their, um, um, in their plan, in their layout, if you like. Um, and I began by just printing one of these circles and I'd print another one directly on top of it, but sort of twisted. Um, and as I move through the series, they become uh, freer and freer. And the, um, the little shapes start to break free of their, um, their grid, if you like, and start yeah. moving around. Yeah. And, and um, I do, when I look at this, I, I remember thinking at the time, as it developed, that, that this was starting to look like a dance, almost as if you yeah. were up in the ceiling looking down on a dance hall, and yeah. each of these little pieces were dancing with each other. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I guess when I was making it, it was very much improvised. So, so for the first few stages, I was literally taking the original piece of cardboard, throwing it down on the paper and wherever it landed, that's where I was printing. And then slowly as it began to develop and I put more shapes down, the white shape became uh, in between became more into play. And I started to look at that as well as where the circles were going. Um, and it began to sort of make demands. So rather than doing it randomly, it started to say, well, we need something over there and mm. we've got those colors there. So let's bring a yellow up into this, this area as well, or maybe use a pink or something brighter. And so it developed in that way, I guess. Um, so it was very much improvised and, and, you know, I don't improvise all of my pieces. I like to work in different ways, um, depending on what it is I'm making. Sometimes I make a rigid plan and I stick to it. Sometimes I get halfway through and change it. And sometimes I completely improvise it. Yeah. But I'm glad you get that sort of that that sense of of it being sort of light and a, a relatively happy piece. Yeah, I mean, also because you've got these overlaps and um, which actually gives it depth. You know, you you don't have them everywhere, but it gives them depth, and that, I think that kind of bring makes them that makes them sort of human. There's something quite sort of human about them. You know, they're mm. like pe little people. Um, that look that looking in, in different directions and kind of interaction interacting with each other having relationships with each other um so i could that's kind of in a way what i see i almost i might almost want to see beyond the shape but more about almost the, it's almost a little bit symbolic you know of just human relationships yeah. and how we're all kind of uh you know we're, we're all kind of you know fiddling around each other, but we're all kind of on, on our own as well, little individuals. So, you know, you can sort of see it with, through that lens as well. Um, and yeah, I just think it works really, really well. I, you know, I, I, you know, and also I like this whole idea of um, how, when you, you, in the beginning, when the page was probably still empty, you started placing the shapes. And then after a while, because of how they were, uh, uh, sort of relating to each other, they were suddenly uh, creating, sort of like demanding that something was put in a, you know, in relation to them. And sort of you have a sort of like, there's a sort of tipping point, isn't there, where the piece is asking you to do something rather than you, you know, uh, rather than you putting it in. So you can't, it's kind of like, you know, you, you're, you're listening out for those for those moments and I guess do you do you actually when you make it do you do you take um do you, do you sort of take breaks from it do you know what I mean I mean I know you have to take breaks because it takes so long but do you sometimes go back and say actually um you know because I can just go command z which undoes what I've done before and you oh, can't yeah. do that can you? you 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 kind of have to stick with what you've got or start again or, or, or find a sort of like a corrective, like a, because I, I imagine that to happen quite a lot where you do something and you, you sort of go, oh, if I don't put something there, it's actually the whole balance that I've got in my head is gone or something like that. Does that, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, a couple of things from what you said. So, so firstly, in terms of the, the overlap, screen printing is so nice for if you're overlapping colors, uh, but it's not always predictable. Yeah. Um, so when I look at that now, you know, I, I look at the, the light blue and the and lime green, which are overlapping and that nice color they produce, but in others, the overlap is much more dense and it almost disappears. Yes. Yeah. Um, exactly. 
but but screen printing i always sometimes think of it as being like sort of low level sculpture because you're literally dealing with layers of ink you put yeah. a layer down you put a layer on top of it yeah. and if you if you look at a piece like this in different lights it can look quite different particularly if there's a sort of side light or a rating raking light from sunlight on it and, and overlaps become apparent that in other light you can't see um and yeah sort of correcting it as you go i guess that's true i mean i can't remember i think this might be an edition of 12 so i was probably working on 14 15 sheets of paper yeah and and um often when i print um to a much more sort of rigid um design i have one sheet marked up in pencil and that's what lets me place everything in the right place mm. on all the subsequent sheets but it also means that if if I put something down on um, that registration sheet and I immediately don't like it, I will stop there and sort of change it or yeah. think about how I might change it. Um, so yeah, yeah. Um, and and um, I guess you know we've mentioned the white space before and, and and how that connects and becomes active between the pieces. This shape was very good for that because it had the cutout. It seemed to give it a direction. You knew which way it was facing, really. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Cool. No, I, I I really love it. I really love it. And we've we've talked about this quite a few times in the last few weeks, haven't we? And um, I'm glad I chose this one to sort of like because I th I think it does it does stand out. I do I do also like your your other pieces where the the actual cutout shape of the the sort of I like also this utilitarian element of it that you you're using everyday objects or everyday sort of packaging bits of packaging material it makes it really approachable and hu and sort of you know sort of like everyday human kind of you know it's like you're making something that is not special you're making it very special by doing that and you're turning it like this one here um mm. which i think is also amazing is um you know you've you've it's like an architectural sort of view of some kind of, um, for me, I, I, I see in a cathedral or a mosque or something like that. Um, and, you know, it reminds me of Morocco somehow, you know, yeah. um, and, you know, you do that with just this one shape and, and color overlaps. And I just, I just think it's, yeah. Yeah. It's really well, 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 but, but the other thing, you're quite right. People will see things in it. So, so you see something ecclesiastical or a mosque or something like that. Um, but but also you can look at that and you, you get a sense of where the stencils come from in the first place. You can see that little sort of slot where it would have been yeah. hanging on 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 the hook in the shop. Yeah. So so as a viewer, I hope hope those two sort of things are in balance. And that that's yeah. why I this is one of the reasons why I think of my work as being sort of as much pop art as it ad, is abstract art because it's using these pieces of of, of packaging and stencils and things. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's um, difficult the whole categorization, isn't it? I think. Yeah. And I think also what you said about the um the what makes it so familiar is exactly that is it is this little shape mm -hmm. um where it's where you know it was hung on the hook in the shop. That is that is what draws you in, I think, and and kind of, you know, as a as a viewer, you can sort of then look at that and then kind of and then and then start seeing the other layers and then start seeing you know like go off on a tangent in your head that's when you then start seeing the sort of the architectural sort of um element of it and um you know uh, it's yeah it's really um it it works really 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 well i think yeah. and also the fact that you chose to have the black at the front yeah you know so you have a sort of a right to left kind of direction in a way yeah. And which is kind of, which is kind of, um, you know, the way the eye works, it sort of t looks top right to left and down. And the, that's, that is really what you do. You look at this and then you, you look at black first and then your eye moves over to the left. And, and that, that action in itself, I think, gives it, gives it a sort of a depth again. It's, it's like almost moving away. If you wanted to, you could see the left-hand side sli as being slightly further away than the right-hand side. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. yeah. And in fact, that was the error I printed first. So, so maybe that comes across. Yeah. And, and, and incidentally, if, if, if people want to know that shape was originally packaging on a roll of sellotape. Oh, yeah. And, and, and that sort of 
curved cutout within it um, was really attractive and I used it on, on several different prints. Anyway, I'm going to stop sharing now because I want to talk about one of your pieces. So. Okay. Um, so um, let's, let's remove that. And um, I first came across your work when I was uh, hanging one of the uh, Crouch and Open Studios group shows in the library in Crouch End. Mm. And, and, and I was just blown away by this piece. I thought it was absolutely wonderful. And um, so if you can, can you put up um, Antidote 2, yeah? Yes, I shall do that now. So, so what did I like about this? Um, I like I like the size of it and the ambition. Um, I love the colours, which were both graphic but also incredibly subtle. Um, I thought they worked really, really well together. And um, yeah, I just want to know know more about this. Really, um, how how do you how do you come up with a piece like this? Where does it start from? Um, how do you make it? Tell us about the process. So it started off with a, um, a photograph. Um, I, I, was, I actually was there. I took a photograph. It's, it's a place in Bavaria, a bit south of Munich, where I happened to be in the middle of winter. It was an incredibly cold, totally snowed under. And I happened to take this one, uh, took lots of pictures, but took this one photograph, which I then rediscovered later on at home it was completely blurred but it just had this composition that spoke to me and I kind of it, it made me want to layer it with color because the original picture photo was completely gray there was no contrast there was nothing to it and the only thing that really stood out was these two little handlebars leading into the leg so this is a massive yeah. um, you know um, bathing leg and that kind of really it made me want to do something with it and I I then you know like my, 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 my tool of choice is, um, is Photoshop, sometimes Illustrator, but in this case it was Photoshop. And that sort of became my bottom layer in, the, in Photoshop. And I kind of started building on top of that, um, sort of like identifying areas I wanted to, uh, you know, I wanted to kind of highlight. And, and it, it was quite a sort of, it, it's, it's a funny one because you know, working on a computer um, and working with files and it kind of implies a certain amount of organization, but actually the way I work is really random. A lot of it is really random. I know I'm very good at using Photoshop because I'm a designer as well. So I, I, yeah. I but I actually, what, what drives me are the sort of the ac the accidents that happen along the way. And um, this, this piece has about, before I, before I decided that this was the one I wanted to go with, I think I made a hundred versions and I have about 2000 layers in Photoshop, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, that kind of, you know, it's all about decision-making where you switch a layer off, you switch on uh, or, 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 or on you, the combination of layers and how transparent they are. And in a way, you know, it ties in a little bit with what, what, you know, the decisions that you make when you create your shapes and they are, you, you know, some, some, some are more translucent than others. In, in Photoshop, you can, you know, you can decide whether you want something to be 100% opaque or, and all the way to 100%, you can, you can turn it down and, you know, really decide what, what level of transparency you want. Sure. Um, but of course, what happens is that, um, uh, you have so much choice, you know? So what I do is I, you know, I, I in this case, I've made very rough outlines of um, the sort of different planes I could see in, in the picture. I also made some up. So some on the left-hand side, that, that gr those green areas, those, those, those uh, sort of, um, you know, the mountain with the, for the forest, um, that wasn't like this in the original picture. I made that up. I just added that in because I wanted to sort of to, to lead into that, into that sunset, you know? Yeah. Um, and, um, 
so I made these very rough outlines because I'm not very interested in being literal or being, I just want to allude to something that is real. You know, the, if, we want, if we want something totally photorealistic, then we can take pictures. So that's not what I'm interested in. I, I just wanted to sort of create something that made me happy as I was making it. And that, that kind of drew me in in the, in the sort of inter, interplay of, of shapes and, and, and you know, cre um, work with this whole idea of, you know, there's this, the sky and the, there's a horizon that gets mirrored in this, in this, in this um, sort of body of water and, you know, how to make very simple decisions as to how to um, create that reflection. Um, and really in the end, you know, it, it was a case of, you know, literally taking the sky and everything you could see above the lake turning it round and putting it inside the lake uh -huh. and, then, and then adding um, a, a layer, a transparent layers on top and creating sort of little shapes of something that shows you there's a, there is a surface. So, um, but, uh, but yeah, but the, the process of it is, is a combination of super quick and super, super slow. So I, I call, call myself a really slow, Per slow uh, worker because um, I take so long to make decisions and I you know I have the, all these layers that I switch on and off and also with each layer you can you can add um, blending uh, modes and you can add filters and you can and then the interplay of that again creates an act so there's a lot of um, almost like uh, willing accidents to happen mm. You know, that, that is really almost sums up a little bit how I, how my decision process is sort of willing ac accidents to happen um, and, and, and then deciding, yeah, I'll go with this and then carrying on, if that makes yeah. sense. Um, I mean, and, and it's clear to me that, that you're very, very skillful in using the programs that you're using, but, but I'm so struck by the atmosphere of this piece. And I know when we've been preparing for this session, we, we have um, talked about how you've worked and how you have sort of hundreds of versions and thousands of layers and things like that. And, and the weird thing that struck me was, was it was really similar to something I read about Frank Auerbach when he was, say, working on charcoal drawings. Mm -hmm. he basically do a drawing in a day, go away, come back um, the next day smudge it all out and pretty much start again. And he'd end up working on the same paper again and again and again, and even have to stick other pieces of paper on to, um, um, yeah, to cover up where he'd actually gone through with his eraser or his hand. Yeah. That, that, that yeah. piece is absolutely beautiful. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a funny one because, um, I don't know, I mean, for me, what, what drives me, I guess, and I think we have, we have talked about this and I, Kind of, I guess, keep banging on about it, but I, it's it's this whole um, idea of having, you know, having something recognizable. So it's it's familiar. You look at a bit like your shapes. You know, it's something that is familiar. It's a view that is familiar, um, yeah. and yet, the, when I look at it, I kind of like to. I like to see things through a sort of a slightly unreal or fantastical lens if, if that makes sense so it's almost like you know seeing what I want to see rather than what's there you know so I spend a lot of time actually doing that <laughs> denying reality <laughs> you know yeah. walking yeah. around uh, and um, you know just sort of yeah I, th I think it's quite it's quite a sort of an emotional emotional lens onto reality and you know you could go into sort of deep psychological reasons why that may be um and um yeah and i think my 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 work is sort of is driven a bit by a sense of um in a way sort of displacement you know um this whole idea of wishful thinking the idea of um longing and yearning for something that you know is is you know, uh, maybe something that you can't have. So maybe, you know, I think we talked about this as well, uh, this whole idea of, um, you know, being 
you know, being and not, you know, being in a in a in a country, you know, being like an immigrant in a way, because uh, I was born here, but in a way, I immigrated here when I, you know, about thirty years ago, and this whole idea, which I think many people who are immigrants can re um, can relate to, is this sense of being neither here nor there, or belonging neither here nor there. So I, I think I've always had this sort of this sort of maybe longing for home. But actually, when home is there, it's not quite right. <laughs> yeah. You know? And I think yeah. that's that has even before I was doing digital art, all my other work was also driven by that kind of um, sort of thought. And I think maybe maybe that's where I, there there are no people in my work. I never put people in them somehow. Yeah, but but I mean, the 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 the, um, the rails imply a human presence. They do. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think we need to move on, but but just just to say, when I look at this 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 image, it's a place I'd like to be in, but I might also find it quite challenging at the same time. <laughs> okay, I'll stop sharing this then. Thanks. Cool. Okay. So, um, shall we talk about how we get started on things? Yeah. Right, yeah. So if I share another image, I go back. I actually want to go back on the fork of this. Ah. Okay, so this is a piece of mine called The Hustle. And um, um, we're going to talk a little bit about how we get started on pieces. Um, and, and in a way, this is, I suppose, not a typical example because, because this piece sort of arose by accident in a way, mm -hmm. or at least the beginning of it was by accident. So um, people who, who've known my work for a few years might remember that I made some pieces that were almost like sort of beehive grids made out of these hexagons, but sort of tightly together. And each of those hexagons is, is two pieces of printing. So you can tell from that one, that's had quite a lot of stages. And I was thinking I might make another one on, in, that, in that kind of way. And so I cut up an old one into its different sections and I was playing around with the, um, the hexagons themselves, um, but found that as I did so, um, as I looked at one, I might put it aside and I, I put it behind me and there happened to be a big white sheet of paper behind me. And I was plopping them down onto the white sheet of paper whilst concentrating on what was in front of me. And then I turned around after half an hour and I realized that what was on the white paper looked much better than what I'd been playing with. Mm. Um, and so that whole grid sort of got exploded and had these gaps in between. So really the start of the hustle was, was very much sort of serendipity. It came about um, by chance, by playing with the work, if you like. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, the kind of gaps which I'd, I'd achieved by accident, I, I, I really liked and wanted to do through the through the piece. Yeah, I think um, we we I think we talked about that the other day, didn't we? That actually um, is this the one where you said that actually originally you were gonna have them sit much closer together? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like, you know, is, yeah. like yeah. like a honeycomb kind of shape. That's right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and did you actually always intend them to be uh, not sort of perpendicular, you know, where they're always going to be sort of slightly at a different angle to each other? Is no, they, they weren't always going to be like that at all, but, I, but, but it looked better to my eye once I'd seen that happen by yeah. accident, yeah. and that's what I wanted to explore. Yeah. And, and, and um, I was really, really interested in, in once, once you'd printed, so, so let's say I, I start top left and I print the red, and then next I um, print um, the yellow over it and you get this nice sort of mixture in between. And then if I want to print that one with the blue and then the, then the white next, um, I'm interested in what shape that's going to make. But to some extent, because you've put one down already, you're limited. It, yeah. it almost has like a gravity around it and where you can place the next one and what the white shape will become in between is influenced by that what's there already. And yeah. so um, I, was, I, I really became interested in that. And, and I sort of imagined this piece. I mean, it's called the hustle, so it's like a dance, okay? 
but it's also um I also think of it as being almost like like a, a microscopic thing that's been sort of blown up so you can see it and these are particles and they're yeah. relating to each other you know and little things like you know the, so they're six-sided shapes so they have points and they have sides and I'm quite interested in how the point of one will relate to the side of the next one um, sort of throughout the piece really yeah but you can also see them as um as little cubes with an open side yeah 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 they, some of them that's how some of them I look at and in a way that's what that's what makes them so it's not that just the colors that makes them different from each other it's also the fact that some of them are really when I look at them I see the cube first before I see the hexagon yeah so they become very different so again there's a sort of a sense of depth there that um uh, you know that's just created by you know by how you how you chose by your color combinations i guess and you know with the the contrast between the light and the dark uh triangle um you know will we'll create that shadow in the middle you know yeah so it's it's yeah <laughs> It, it, yeah, it, it's sometimes I see them as being open boxes and sometimes I don't, you know, it, it, it varies from time to time. And this was yeah. also one of those pieces where um, it wasn't totally planned. I took a photograph of, of, of my first go at sort of composing it and followed that to some extent. Um, but there were places where I changed my mind and made different decisions. And I particularly like using this, this, this creamy white that's almost the same color of the paper. Yeah. Yeah. And laying that over a colour. So, so um, second row, um, just one in from the right, that one where it's red and then has the cream over it. Yeah. That's a really crucial element in that piece to me. And that, when I put that down, it really came to life to me. I really like those ones which, which have the, the cream over a colour or the grey. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and that's another, another nice big piece. It's almost a full sheet of, of, of the paper that I use. Yeah, that is big. Oh, yeah, it's very big, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but, yeah. but, you know, quite often the pieces that I work with will be um, um, based on, on quite complete drawings. So if I show you, um, here we are. This is a drawing I did do through lockdown. We'll talk about what people did in lockdown um, later on. Here's one which, which I did and I was really, really pleased with this drawing and I thought I'm just going to, when I can get back in the studio, I'm going to make that as a screen print. And mm. so here it is in action on the press being mm. made. And um, I've, I've taken it a bit further on from there. Um, I might talk about that piece a bit more, but, you know, so sometimes I'm starting from something like that. Sometimes it's improvised. I deliberately yeah. try yeah. And, and vary what I do. Okay. Yeah. But, but. Amazing. I'm going to stop sharing that and, and, and I'd like you to, to tell me a bit more about how, how you get started on pieces. Um, and I know uh, we've already talked about Antidote, Antidote 2, so maybe look at something that's a bit more recent than that. Oh uh, yeah, I can show you, I'll show you, um, maybe I will just, let me just put the, um, share my screen again. So, um, this is like progression, they, they came a bit later, but this is Daydream 1. And um, this was again, like an accidental thing that happened here, but it was, it, which turned into a little bit of a departure uh, from, from how I was doing my previous pieces, which were very much, um, you know, starting off with a photograph at the bottom and then building layers on top until the photograph completely disappeared. Whereas, whereas here, um, I just happened to leave one of the layers, um, uh, you know, at a certain transparency and there was a, a filter on there and it, it basically made those birds kind of suddenly stand out. And then I decided I really want to keep those birds and you know the nature of how I was working also meant that some the rest of the picture also kind of the the the, the photograph still was kind of peeking through everywhere so yeah. I, I decided to to 
you know, to kind of um, stick with that and work with it and then add, add stuff to it. And I then sort of add more transparent layers uh, like that, that uh, shape in the foreground, which looks like a water feature that wasn't actually originally there, but I added that because it's kind of what I, I felt that the space wanted it, you know, and I wanted to, you know, I, you know, I wanted it to, to sort of, um, to sort of sit there and stand out against, um, against the, the grass, uh, if you can see that. Um, yep. But how did I start this? Um, because you asked, how did yes. I start this piece? It, it's, it's, for me, it's a really hard question to answer from a sort of practical point of view. The way I start is usually with a photograph that I, that I put, that I take into Photoshop and then I start building stuff on top. But sometimes I don't have a photograph. And um, I think for me, um, I need to be very much, so my art practice uh, very much depends on um, a, a sort of like the right, I mean, maybe it's the same for everyone, but the right combination of, you know, how I feel, uh, whether my brain is free to actually kind of like throw myself into some kind of creative process and, um, and a sort of a, uh, you know, that sort of sense of, um, yeah, when I've, when I've seen something and it's sort of gripped me and I've kind of, and it's, it's triggered this thing in me where I like to layer something on top that I want to combine it with, or I want to, you know, this whole, what I was saying earlier, this thing of seeing something that isn't there, but what I want to see, it's like this lens that kind of like makes everything uh, in a way beautiful, makes everything kind of like, um, you know, yeah, not, not sugary or saccharine, but kind of like you want to eat it, you know? <laughs> I think yes. we said that the yeah, other yeah. day, you want to eat the print. <laughs> yeah, um, to eat. And, um, and so when, when I've got that and that combines itself with, you know, some kind of imagery, then, then I can get going and then I, I just get going and I, you know, pile the layers on and the shapes and the transparencies and I, then I just, you know, reject it and I leave it for ages and I go back. So it's a lot of what I, the way I work is like bursts of, you know, activity and then, and then going away and then looking at it and going, oh no. And then I've got to leave it for a while because I know I'm too, far in it and of course you know I can't move around I'm in front of the screen the whole time so I don't have a space around me where you know I could put something there and then work on that you know it's all within the same space namely this computer which has hundreds of files of beginnings of artworks and rejected artworks and <laughs> and things that are in process um or in progress and um a lot of the pieces that I end up um, wanting to show or I'm happy with are pieces that have taken many months to get to that point because they've gone through, through this process of like genesis and then being sort of parked parked for quite a long time and then mm -hmm. almost being rediscovered so it's like I can look at them with a fresh eye like like it wasn't me who made it in the first place and I'm just going to go in and interfere with it <laughs> you know yeah. um, so I think that's very much across the board, no matter stylistically how I change things, that across the board, that is how I work, definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, I guess I get that when um, sometimes I've made a piece and, and not been completely satisfied and put it away in a drawer and, and I don't take it out for 18 months and then I take it out and suddenly, oh, actually, yeah, that bit wasn't bad. I yeah. could do something like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so, and, and it's so interesting to me you know, you talk about your work in very emotional terms and your process of working in, in um, very emotional terms yeah. as well. Um, and and uh, I love your pieces in terms of their colour, but this one has, you know, bits where you can actually see part of a real life landscape. Yeah. A again, it seems quite quite an alien kind of landscape to me. It's, it's sort of familiar and yet it's not at the same time. Yeah, yeah and, and I really like that. Sense well, the thing, is, the thing is also with this piece, and there's another piece called Daydream Two, which I did yeah, during, during, during lockdown. Just, just, just as a transition to that one, 
Um, mm. So this piece has, um, existed for a long time without that blue shape in the, in the foreground. And, um, and I wasn't happy. I really wasn't happy. And I left it for, lo for a long time before I then decided to add that shape in. I looked at it and went, ah, oh, there's a solution. So it's almost like problem solved. I found the thing that I need to do. So this reminds me a bit of what you said earlier, where, you know, the piece is calling to you, telling you, well, actually, it's dictate, almost dictating that shape and that shape together and those colors dictating that over here, I need to yeah. put something. And then yeah. suddenly it comes together. Yeah? yeah. That's the yeah. best feeling. And the same thing happened for me with the next piece. So actually, I, another thing I was going to say is um, because I work digitally, this whole idea, this whole fact of when do I stop and when do I actually have it printed? Because I'm not a printmaker as such. I'm a digital artist and the final sure. thing is a print. And so this is what it looked like printed out. Yeah. And yeah, so yeah. just to get the colors right when it prints out, that is a very nerve wracking moment. I can tell you oh, that. I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. But we, yeah. I guess we can, we can talk about that a bit later. I'm going to go to, I'm going to go to daydream too. So this one I did during lockdown, but again, I started it. Um, honestly, I started it. I think I, the actual original picture I started before lockdown. Yeah. And, um, I then revived it and fiddled with it for ages and just wasn't happy. I even changed the colors and, and, you know, I have literally, I looked at it earlier. I think I have about 50 versions of this picture <laughs> and, and in completely different kind of um, color relationships etc etc but actually I went back to the very first one in a way that I I chose it in terms of just the the luminescence of the sky and the sort of uh the sort of um surreal nature I guess of this foreground which you, if you look at it it actually it is grass but is it and there's this sort of stream in the middle which actually was there but you know the reflections aren't quite right you know um but then like with the other one, I felt that something was missing. And then I suddenly thought, I'm just going to add these two shapes, uh, which are, what are they? You know, yeah. are they clouds? Yeah. Are they clouds or are they, are they are lenses within the lens? So I'm looking at this landscape through a lens of, I want to see, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm looking at th through my own lens of, you know, I want it to be different than what's there. So I'm just going to make it different. And within this view, you now have these two extra lenses, which again, change, change what's behind them. Um, and, you know, you know, for ages, I just, you know, fiddle with the shape of those shapes, the shape of those shapes. Um, at one point, the cloud on the, at the, um, the cloud I'm calling it now, but the, in the top left was sort of coming in from the corner. It wasn't actually in, encapsulated within the image it was coming in from the corner yeah, and I yeah. left it there for probably about three weeks you know I was happy with it to begin with and I went back to it three weeks later and thought nah I've got to move it back in you know so <laughs> so think things like that and it's very difficult to explain explain why that is and why one thing felt right and the other didn't but I think um yeah I think you know I look at it now and actually i when printed it I printed it out um and this is what it looked like uh printed uh, out i think actually this image is a slightly more red it actually is the colors are more accurate yeah than what you're looking at it at, at now and um and yeah it, it 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 was a bit of a process to get it here because the colors there are lots of murky colors. Like murky colors are difficult if you have lots of transparencies, uh, transparent layers on top of each other in, in Photoshop that haven't got quite clear colors. And you end up with this sort of murkiness, which uh, when you print it out, whereas on screen, because you've got the backlit nature of the screen, you can still see the detail and you can still see the colors because you have the luxury of the light coming in from behind. But of course, when you print it out, that doesn't happen. Yeah. And, and so I have done a few versions of this where it just, 
you know, where the forest is at the top and especially in the bit with the, in the reflection, that was just not right. And so I had to fiddle quite a bit to, to get it to this point. So it was very nice to, when I finally, um, you know, it finally happened. <laughs> Um, can, I, can I ask you one very quick question, which I've not asked you before, but it occurred to me as you were speaking just then. Would you ever print out two different versions of the same image, or do very you always just print the final one? Very, very good question. And um, uh, <laughs> I, I want to say no. Yeah. But the thing is that I have some versions of, of this, for instance, which I really love, you know, mm. and as a part of me, and this is, I think this is where the sort of whole, um, maybe controversy comes in about being a digital artist that who prints something out, uh, that, you know, there's this misnomer that you can make lots of versions really, really quickly, you know, and then, you know, whatever, sell it for lots of money or something like that. But actually it's not true because anything you do is, is a result of a decision-making process, you know? And just because you can change things quite quickly doesn't mean that whatever you've changed it to is gonna be right or is gonna be, you, you still have to go in and, and sort of like, you know, engage with it and, 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 and kind of have a, um, you know, you know, an, an interaction with it, a conversation with it, you have to sort of d decide why you do things, you know, yeah. it's not quick at all. Um, so yes, uh, I think it's a yes, maybe is the answer. Yes, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think I'm, I've rambled on for long enough now. Haven't I? It's okay. Um, we, we can go back on that one if we need yeah. to. Yeah. So, yeah. so what, what have you been doing during lockdown? Let me just stop okay. sharing this. Yeah. You got any pieces that you've... Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll just sh very quickly show you a couple and then we can we can make time for some, some questions. Um, so oh, let's go back where we were, share that. Okay. Um, oh yes, this one, this, I saw this in your studio tonight. Yeah, in fact, this, this is the one you, you were assisting me with the actual, yeah. the actual printing. But let, let um, so, so when I, Starting the lockdown, I wasn't able to go to the studio, so I did lots of drawing at home, um, absolutely lots. Um, and I will just try and get up the, the one I actually want. Um, oh, went too far. And, and, and I, I did several of these pieces where I used squares, triangles, circles, and, and, and rectangles. So actually sort of four different elements. Mm -hmm. And I did, I don't know, five or six drawings using these and, and, and then and still got some white space in there and, and nice strong diagonals like uh, Bridget Riley always says is a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so this is one of the pieces that I've printed from those, those lockdown drawings. Um, this one's called Progress Report. The other one was called Toy Box. And actually when I was making these, I don't know if, uh, when, when my children were young, we had a nice box of wooden blocks from the Early Learning Center which were literally yeah. these basic shapes yeah squares and triangles and, and arches as well which were yeah. really nice I, I i like them more than my children did i think um, <laughs> but, but it's also having done, done the drawing on this um and then starting making it as a screen print it's quite a good example of, of a final decision and changing ideas mm. Mm. so on the original drawing you see that this this yellow circle up top right here um, which overlaps on the red, um, that was originally um, going to be grey, same as this colour down on, 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 on the bottom left. Mm. Um, and I reached the point where that was the very last stage to be printed. And I thought, I'm not sure grey is the best option. It'll look all right if I use it, but perhaps I should change it. And I sort of cut out bits of bits of paper and dried them out and, and settled in the end to use that yellow instead, which I think lifted the whole piece. But I think also what lifts it a lot or what gives, again, what gives it depth is the fact that you feel like you're looking through this sort of, um, you know, through that, the gaps, there are gaps, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, they do feel like gaps, don't yeah, they? Yeah, they really do feel like that, but it feels like a bit of a window, you know, like a, not stained glass window, but you know what I mean, where you just sort of, there's something behind. And I think the, 
is that is that an area that you actually didn't print at all? What the the, 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 the white the, the, the gap bits? Yeah, no, that's just the paper. Yeah. So because yeah. they look lighter. It's funny when you look at them and they look lighter than the than the border. Yeah, well, but I, I, I'm colours are never alone, are they? They're always doing things. No, exactly. Which is amazing around. that it's doing that. I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's nice. Nice. The white is the diagonal, and it picks up the diagonal that's down yeah. here as yeah. well. So compositionally, I was I was very pleased with that. And yeah. then I've already, already shown you this drawing. There's another drawing that came out from this period, um, which is being turned into a screen print. And, and I quite like artists who have sort of rules. So Solar Witt, people may know, who was an American minimalist artist. And sometimes all he did was actually send people a set of instructions. And then they would make the work from the rules yeah. that he sent them. But the fascinating thing is, whoever you gave it to, they turned up with something different. <laughs> no one ever interpreted the rules in the same place. The rule I had with this one is I didn't just didn't want the same colour next to each other. So it's made entirely with three colours. Um, and you know, if you like, these are like little flags in groups of five. Yeah. Then you get a gap, and then you get another column of those. Yeah. But I even tried to do it so that the rule would apply across the gaps in most places. So you've okay. got yellow and green there. You've got a gap, kind of yellow green on the other side. So you have a red. Um, so those sort of rules apply most of the way through. In places, it breaks down a little bit, um, but not much. And, yeah. and I'm, I'm really excited about how this piece has developed. And then yeah, I was also crazy. lucky, we'll scoop past that one, um, to get a really big commission during lockdown. Oh, yeah, brilliant. 14 new screen prints. Um, and Lara Harwood, who I think is also listening in, was also part of this this job and she was making murals there. Yeah, lovely. And Great. these are installation shots for some of these pieces. So they're all different. They're all based on an earlier piece of mine called Call and Response. But on each of the floors of this building, I used different color sets and different arrangements. And that was amazing. Um, and it was a really good job. And I worked closely with my son, Rory, on that one, who helped hugely, particularly with when I had a broken collarbone. Right oh my then. goodness, yes. Okay. So, <laughs> yes, that's um, really good. Thank you. So, so I think we've probably um, talked enough, and, and I think there have been some questions. Um, so, shall we? Uh, There's plenty more you, to Simon. say. You know. <laughs> oh yeah, I know. We, you know, we, we, this is our fourth conversation, and we could do a whole series or write a book, really, couldn't yeah. we? <laughs> yeah. But yeah, let, let's see if there's any any questions people have asked us that we can uh, we can respond to. Over well, to you, Yana. Okay, so thanks for everyone who's made questions. Um, what, uh, one of the first questions is, I think on your first work, Kev, uh, Kevin says, is intrigued by Richard's color selection. How does he come to the final palette decisions? He loves your work. Thank you. Um, so I, I, I guess I'll, I'll say just quickly two things about colors. Um, so I like using a range of colors as you can see but by a range I mean like like using some that are, are much more subdued or darker um, as well as much brighter ones and, and I generally like to have a combination of, of, of those two elements within a piece and I think people often when they first look at a work are drawn to the yellows or the reds or the lime greens or whatever happen to be there um, but then if, if it was a piece they actually lived with over a period of time then actually they they look at um, um, some of the darker colours too and see how they related. Um, and I, I guess the other thing to say is actually the colours I use are actually quite influenced by how I mix the colours in the first place. So I was taught when I did my degree at University of Hertfordshire this really nice method and you only ever buy um, eight different colours. You buy two reds, two yellows, two blues, a black and a white and you can mix anything from those. And the two reds, for example, one will be closer to purple and one will be closer to orange. So you can go towards another color if you're mixing or you can go away from it. Um, and I've just, ever since I was taught that, I've always used that method for mixing my colors. And I think that influences the colors I end up with. And I suppose one final thing I'll say on that is, is I've learned to trust my choices over the years. And, and feel that, you know, generally speaking, I can, I can make good choices in terms of colours. Before I did my degree, I was scared of colour. I, I just drew and, you know, um, and did etchings. So everything was black and white. 
<laughs> it was so 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 great when I woke up to colour on at college and it, it totally changed how I worked. Mm. And then somebody says the square the white squares um, that connect is just as exciting as the circles. Yes, aren't they? <laughs> I, I agree. Yeah, it's absolutely thrilling. There are other pieces I could have shown you where, where to me, the white space in between shapes is, is, is pretty much the main focus. And, you know, depending on what shape you're working with, if you use hexagon, you can, you can tie it into a grid. But if you use an octagon, you can't. Hmm. You either have to have white spaces in between or you have to have overlaps if you're going to make a sort of solid body of work. So, so the shape itself can sort of dictate that. Hmm. I think this is to do with stolen hours, but could this be considered a figurative piece, even though it's Ooh. abstract? Yeah, it, <laughs> uh, possibly, yeah. Um, and, and the title, we've not really talked about titles. No, we haven't, the, have we? The, 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 no. The title to me refers to a specific place where I was happy. Um, but again, with, with that stencil, you may remember I said it was from a, 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 um, a roll of sellotape. Um, mm. Originally, I just made pieces where, where you followed the curve round and made circular pieces with it. And it was actually, I just plumped the stencil down on a piece I was working with and realized you could make that archway. But what you had to do was have two screens because it's not a symmetrical shape. So you have to have one one way and one the other to be able to do it. Yeah, and, and um, Sandra and I have, have talked for three sessions before I realized that at no point did we discuss the question that my work might generally be considered abstract and hers might be considered sort of figurative or landscape. It just didn't occur to us to, no, to, funny, to talk about that at yeah. all, which yeah. is really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I love it when people see things in my, my sort of commercial shapes and, and they see animals in them or, or machines, insects. Or buildings. Uh, buildings, yeah. yeah. And I think this question from Caroline could have referred to both of you really. When making this, but she pr I think means still and ours, did you keep one orientation or change it? Yeah, so, so I, I think I might now have answered that. Yeah, so it's, it's um, I had to make two screens. Um, you know, the, the little circles with the cutout and the multi-purpose pieces, that's fine. That's just this one shape and, you know. Um, but yeah, to get that archway, you had to have it both ways. And now this, I think, is m more to you, Sandra. Why do you choose the imagery that you do? Hmm. Well, um, I think it's to do with um, this idea of having a vantage point and being able to immerse yourself in a space. And I think landscape, I, I'm, I'm very keen on horizons and skies. Something that feels bigger than me, something that feels bigger than than anyone really, um, that you can be in the midst of. Um, and so even my small pieces, and I think I sort of rushed through a couple of them er earlier, which are quite small, like there's one, there's um, a path, path uh, two is, is about this big, but even that has a horizon line in it. So I think the quick answer to the question is, is you know, I'm a sucker for horizon lines, <laughs> you know, and um, yeah, so, Definitely, that that is what um, I tend to gravitate towards. Yeah. And then this is a strange question: Is this also a creep print? Uh, I I wondered if that was meant to say screen print. <laughs> okay, good. That's explained that question then. <laughs> I think that's oh. you, Sandra. Um, no, mm. they're not screen prints. Mm. They are digital digital prints. They're all limited editions, but they are digital prints. So, so this whole thing about, you know, at what point do I say, okay, I'm going to have it printed. That's quite, an, quite nerve wracking. I mean, literally nerve wracking every time I get to that point and it's, I take it to the printers and just, you know, just to know, to find out whether it actually is what I want it to be. And having had no control over that, that last, step um 
apart from being very exciting, of course, and um, it feeling like Christmas every time when it does work out, it's, it's quite nerve wracking. Yeah. But no, they're not screen prints, they're digital prints. So I don't do any of the, the, the ink, the inky physical part, I don't do. And now, I think this is in to do with Antidote 2. Uh, well, the one with the, the rails and the yeah. water. Um, this person, Sarah, is very interested in the tiny shape of lighter lilac, bottom left, which she thinks is genius. Can you talk about that? Tiny shape of lighter lilac? I looked and I couldn't see that either. There's a tiny shape of lighter lilac. Let me see. I need to look at it. <laughs> well, you, you, can, you can quickly share it again if you like. I could do, couldn't I? Mm. And we can all see what we have. Yeah. Tiny shape of lighter lilac. Yeah. I wonder which hand. I wonder if it's um. I can't see a tiny shape of lighter lilac. There's quite a lot of lilac going on in this piece, mm. um, and I'm wondering whether it's. I don't know. Sarah's saying it's not that one. Ah, you see. Oh, okay. Good. Is it this one? Or is it one of mine at all? Does Sarah say anything? I'm going to unmute Sarah, okay? <laughs> Sarah? Hi, Sarah. Can't hear Sarah. <laughs> uh, yes, your first one. Oh, the first one. Yeah, the antidote. Uh, no, not that one. Ah, uh, okay. Okay, the very first one where you showed it. <gasps> it wasn't me, it was Richard. No, do you know what? I've realized that I was looking at it on a smaller screen oh, okay. and I'd, I'd just seen this as its whole. And what I was viewing was a, a cropped version. And ah. I, it was genius. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'll take that any time. <laughs> it is wonderful. It was cropped, so. <laughs> okay. Okay, okay cool. All right. And Kevin Thanks, is Sarah. also saying this to you, Sandra, is why is this saying Hockney to me? This picture. It's this one. Um, I think maybe because it's because it's a swimming pool. <laughs> I think someone else has said that before. I think, um, I love Hockney. I mean, you know, I, I can't say he was necessarily, you know, a consciously an influence. Can't say that, but, um, but I think it's maybe the sort of flat, flat surfaces, flat surfaces and then sort of just water feature. He has a lot of water in his, pieces hasn't he and he has a lot of skies and sort of these man-made kind of structures with water in them so maybe that's why I think maybe but, but I, I reckon it's probably the handlebars leading into the into the water that are slightly reminiscent of the the splash <laughs> yeah and, and this one Richard do you use computers photoshop in your work for example trying out your compositions use of color in advance of printing them um well I I used to, but but actually I used to use Microsoft Paint. Oh, um, <laughs> I've, I've hardly, hardly, I've very occasionally used something like Illustrator, but, um, um, and I do very occasionally use um, the computer to, to make the stencil. Um, so there are some pieces of mine which have, have sort of circular grids of, of sort of lines and I print those out onto acetate and then transfer those onto the, onto the screen. Um, but actually less and less as the years have gone by. I, I actually literally sit down with coloured pencils and, um, and um, graph paper and, and tend to do it that way. And it, it's quite a long, laborious process, um, but it does tend to work. 
Um, and, and yeah, so I don't use the computer very much uh, in my pieces, but it, it's, it's a good question. And, you know, I'd probably quite like to learn how to use some of that Adobe Illustrator um, better than I know how. Um, I do quite like Microsoft Paint. It's very crude. It's, it's a nice... Um, sometimes when I do lettering on, on print, for example, um, I'll print those onto acetate from a computer. And that slightly sort of pixelated thing you get is really nice when you then screen print through the, what you've put on the screens. Mm. And, and Sandra, could you talk, this is from me, could you talk a little about the influence a graphic novel form has had on your work? Ah, yes. Um, that's an interesting one because, um, you know, I have spent my entire childhood, adolescence, and also some of my adulthood, you know, just loving graphic novels. Um, just, you know, loving the fact that the, the, you have these little con contained little spaces that form a narrative, um, you know, together and, you know, you sort of led across the page. So the actual, the actual um, activity of reading is really actually just looking at pictures. <laughs> um, and, um, and, you know, and I think, I think my work is influenced by, by having spent so much time reading, you know, or looking at graphic novels. And I'm not talking even about necessarily like, you know, a, a vast array of graphic novels, but I've been, I've been, I was a massive, you know, Tintin fan and Asterix fan. And I, I'm, I grew up with all the, the French and Belgian um, kind of uh, bon dessiné, which, you know, I went to a French school. So we were, that, that's kind of what we, what we had in our, Instead of Instagram and instead of mobile phones, we were just reading Asterix and Gaston Lagaffe. And um, one uh, one I I discovered much later is a, an artist called Jean um, Jean Giraud, and he made the series called um, he's, he calls himself Moebius, and he makes these absolutely amazing um, uh, kind of drawings. They are so um, they, they are a little bit reminiscent if you think of Star Wars and how imaginative the the the, the costumes are and there's these sort of extraterrestrial figures he he does that in his drawings and they he uses the most beautiful colors and just and also what he does he's he breaks away from the whole box next to box next to box next to box he has some sometimes a, um, one uh, drawing will take up a whole page and then you turn the page and you have then the, ca the, the story carries on but every single one of them I wish I could show it to you now it's just lovely and he, yeah that really you know I wish I could draw like that frankly um, mm. uh, he, he, that it just it's like sugar you know I mean it's like candy it really is I, I, I have to be careful not to look at them too much <laughs> um that's really and i think the sense of escapism you get from these books that is a big one for me because you i think you can escape into a book into an actual book with words you know but i think there's there's something to be said for escaping into a book with pictures because it's so immersive i find it really really immersive and um uh, where the image is still more important than the word, you know. Um, yeah. Thank you. That's my answer to that question. <laughs> Richard, um, Alison says, I love your recent print progress report. Could you say a few words about that? Um, yes, so progress report. Um, I spoke about it. Do you want to a share it already? Um, yeah, okay. Uh, let me quickly put it back up. Um, have I still got PowerPoint slides? Yes, I have. Okay. Oh, actually, I, I'll, I'll just put it up for a moment. Um, because I'll, I'll, I'll also show you, um, yeah, so, so to remind you, so, so 
here we are. It's just constructed with the, these basic um, geometrical elements. It has a circle in the middle. Um, the diagonals drive through it. Um, but, but what I'll show you actually, because I happen to have it here, and I don't know if you'll be able to see this if I hold it up, um, is I've got the, the original drawing here, um, ah. which is based on. Um, so you can see, you know, these were the drawings I was doing in lockdown. Um, and there were several others in the series. Um, and the colours, it's sort of reflecting quite strongly. But um, um, yeah, so someone, I can just see Gabrielle's put, put a comment up about it being sort of balanced as a composition. Um, yeah, I was really looking at to do that. And there were colours in that image, which I really, really like. So the blue, for example, um, is, is something I worked really hard to get that blue. And it's slightly sort of lilac or mauve, mm. not, not completely. Uh, but it's got all those things I like. So, you know, I really like the gray and the brown together there. That's really nice. Mm. And, and it's, it's, it sort of hints at being symmetrical around this sort of central, central area. But then the diagonals take you away from that symmetry. Mm. Um, and and you know, my work is about pattern to some extent, but the pattern is nearly always disrupted or broken up to some extent. So when we were looking at... Um, when we were looking at this one, Stolen Hours, and Sandra was commenting about this black shape at the end, that, that breaks that pattern up mm. so that you don't get a repetition of what's in the first two areas. It, 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 you know. So I like to break the pattern up. So I'm really pleased you like it. And, and as I say, I, I've made two pieces from that series and there's a third one I'm, I'm yet to make, which is a slightly different composition, but uses those different elements. And yeah, that, that one's done done fine. I mean, I finished that about nine months ago. I've sold a couple and people really like it and I really like it too. And Thank Caroline you. wants to know, Richard, why do you choose screen printing rather than other forms of printing? Ah, so I do sometimes make woodcuts, um, which is a much more direct way of working. And, and I guess over the years, I've, I've tried to make my woodcuts more and more sort of minimal. So you have more of a sense of the wood. But, but that's very direct, you know, you can cut into a wood and you've made a mark and then it'll print, but you get that extra thing as well. You get the light and shade of the, the, the uh, grain coming through. Um, I originally, when I first went to college, I was, I was an etcher. Um, I was taught by a really, really good teacher at Hampstead School of Art in evening classes to do etching. Um, um, but when, when I moved on to colour, that's when, when screen printing really came into its own. And I was never much of a painter. Um, and and um, the artists I began to like when I became interested in colour used, used flat, even areas of colour, quite sort of graphic. And screen printing was just perfect from that. Mm. So I guess sort of 80% of my output is screen printing and I do some woodcut as well. But yeah, it, it, it just suits what I want to do, screen printing. It's a very good medium for it. And then Margaret said when she first saw the hustle, she saw hexagons and now she looks at them, they look like open cubes. Very interesting how perspectives can change. Yes, yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. And, and the, the, the earlier pieces I, I, I made where I used hexagons um, had names that sort of alluded to the fact that you could see that it's a three-dimensional space. So the very first one I made was called Get Lost. And the idea is, you know, if you were really small, you could crawl inside those cubes and literally get lost. Mm -hmm. And then I liked that. And so the other pieces I made in the series all had quite rude titles, like Buzz Off and Running Jump. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that, I know. But, but until Sandra brought it, I, 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 I was seeing it all as flat shapes again. So it can move between the two. Mm -hmm. And this, I think, is to Sandra um, about your colour choices are amazing. Do you want to talk about your colour choices? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I have, I sort of lately have been gravitating towards this sort of bright orange uh, contrasting with, um, you know, blue and bluey green 
and I don't really know why, to be honest. Um, uh, it's it it just sort of. I, I, I just I think I just think it makes me happy to be honest I think a lot of what I do is to do with kind of making myself feel joyful about you know color can do that especially color combinations um, I've always been surprised why especially my earlier pieces that why I've sort of gravitated towards using um, kind of pinky lilac -y type colors because actually in real life those are not colors I particularly like and yet I tend to use them when I'm making um, my, my, my work. And I think maybe it's to do with the fact that they are kind of, they're so, they're so artificial to a degree that they sort, of, they sort of inject the whole thing with immediately with a layer of kind of like, you know, not, it's not real. It's, it's sitting on, on, a, on, a, on a depiction of something real, but actually itself, it's not real. So it kind of creates that, that shift away from um, from the fam familiarity of the the original photograph that's at the bottom of my Photoshop um, file, um, and I think I think also maybe this is maybe where you know the graphic novels and you know Tintin and Moebius and all these people come in, you know where you know you, you can do whatever you like, you know it's it's you know you can you can create you know, use, use flat colors, use, you know, juxtapose them, find a third color that will make the other two colors that look like they were clashing before, now they work because they're kind of sitting together. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's all about, I can't say that it's necessarily a conscious, they're not conscious decisions. These things come together. Um, one, co one color calls for another and then, mm -hmm. uh, and a certain transparency then calls for a certain filter and a certain blending mode. And that again, sometimes I have to switch it off and try something new. So it's, it really is so much about trial and error. And um, I just surprise myself sometimes with what's come out, to be honest. This is something you can do when you work on a computer. You can just go click, 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 switch with switch, and then suddenly you have something completely new. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah I don't know if that answers the question it's difficult I can't really sort of yeah. um, and then you've answered this question I think are they giglet prints or uh, screen prints I think you've answered that question yeah they're giglet yeah, yeah. Um, and do you print many of the same image and then number them That's yes a... they are limited editions mm -hmm. quite quite small limited limited editions yeah and I think that this one is to Richard, do you work on graph paper often? Um, yeah, quite a lot. I, I, I have a, um, two drawing pads going at the same time, one with graph paper and one with, um, and one that's just plain. Um, some of the pieces I make, I like it on the graph paper so much that one day, I keep telling myself I'm gonna do this, I'm actually gonna take a photocopy of a sheet of graph paper turn it into an acetate and put it on the screen so I can have graph paper on the screen for an image. I think that would be a really nice thing to do, um, to acknowledge that. Um, I, I did a, a cover for the, a book cover for the Folio Society. And when I first sent them drawings for that, I said, actually, you could just have the drawing on graph paper um, and it would look really, really nice. Um, yeah, I really like, and I, I've got nice big A3 graph paper pads, as you saw when I held it up. And I'm just going to take one more question because we're running out of time. And from, for both of you, from Yuka, do you have the, an idea of the work in your head before you start working on a piece? Now, this could take 90 minutes to answer this question. Quick answer from me. Often I do, and then I start working on it, and then it turns out to be something completely different. <laughs> and Richard? Um, mostly, yes, um, but not always. And you can often find a point in the process of printing. So, so you might make six or seven stages in the day and you might be making a piece, say, with 30 stages of printing in it. And there'll come a point, a balance point, where you know it's going to work out. Mm. You add a new colour, you add a new shape, and it's suddenly the whole thing comes to life. And, and, and if that's not in the original drawing, you, you need to change direction mm. or put it away in the drawer so no one ever sees it. 
Okay, thank you so much to both of you and thank you to everybody who has uh, come to the uh, conversation, the second conversation between two Crouch and Open Studio artists.